When one personality meets another for the first time, there is a period of mutual examination on the intuitive level of empathy and identification. But it was impossible to relate oneself to Dooley in any way. He was simply the focal point for a hostile, intrusive force. You could feel him walk right into your psyche and look around to see if anything was there he could make use of. I stepped back a little from the door to avoid contact with him. He squeezed himself into the room and immediately sat down on the couch and lit a cigarette. It's better to meet alone like this. His smile was ambiguously sexual. Nick is a very uncool guy. He stood up and handed me four dollars. Do you mind if I take off here? He asked, pulling off his coat. I had never heard anyone else use this expression. For an insane moment, I thought he was making advances. He dropped his coat on the couch and rolled up his sleeve. I brought him two caps and a glass of water. He had his own works for which I was grateful. Let me tell you something, he said. You're making a big mistake to trust Nick. A few nights ago, I was in Thompson's cafeteria and I ran into Rogers, the agent. He told me, I know Nick is scoring for all you goddamn junkies here in the village. You are getting good stuff too, between 16 and 20 percent. Well, you can tell Nick this. We can take him any time we want. And when we do catch up to him, he's going to work with us. He opened up for me once. He'll do it again. We're going to find out where this stuff is coming from. Dooley looked at me and sucked on his cigarette. When they get Nick, they'll get you. You'd better let Nick know that if he talks, you'll have him poured into a barrel of concrete and dumped in the East River. I don't need to tell you any more. You can see what the situation is. He looks at me, trying to gauge the effect of his words. It was impossible to tell just how much of this story I was expected to believe. Perhaps it was just a roundabout way of saying, how will you ever know who fingered you? With Nick such an obvious suspect, if I talked, you could never be sure, could you now? Could you let me have one cap on credit? He asked. What I've just told you should be worth something. I gave him a cap, and he pocketed it without comment. He stood up. Well, I'll be seeing you. I'll call at the same time tomorrow. I put out a grapevine to see what I could find out about Dooley and to check his story. No one knew anything definite about him. Tony, the bartender, said, Dooley will think if he has to, but he couldn't give me a definite instance. Dooley came around every day, impudent, demanding, insufferable. Usually he had some new bulletin on the Nick Rogers situation. He didn't mind letting me know that he was in constant touch with Rogers. On top of this, I was just barely scraping by. The short counts we kept getting from the wholesaler the constant nibbles of credit and customers coming up 25, 50, or even a dollar short, plus my own habit. Cut profits to bare subsistence. When I complained about the wholesaler, Bill Gaines got snappish and said I ought to cut the stuff more. You're giving a better cap than anybody in New York City. Nobody sells 16% stuff on the street. 
If your customers don't like it, they can take their business to Walgreens. Tony's bar still gave me the horrors. One day it was raining very hard and I was on my way to Tony's about a half hour late. Ray, the young Italian hipster, stuck his head out of the door of a restaurant and called me over. It was a lunch counter with booths along one wall. We sat down at a booth and I ordered tea. There's an agent outside in a white trench coat, Ray told me. He followed me over here from Tony's and I'm afraid to go out. I drank my cup of tea, thanked him for the information and left ahead of him. I had this stuff in a package of cigarettes and was ready to throw it in the water-filled gutter. Sure enough, there was a burly young man in a white trench coat standing in a doorway. When he saw me, he started sauntering up the street ahead of me. Then he turned a corner, waiting for me to walk past so he could fall in behind. I turned and ran back in the opposite direction. When I reached 6th Avenue, he was about 50 feet behind me. I vaulted the subway turnstile and shoved the cigarette package into the space at the side of a gum machine. I ran down one level and got a train up to the square. After that, things got worse and worse. One day, the hotel clerk stopped me in the lobby. I don't know how to say this, he said, but there's something wrong about the people who come up to your room. I used to be in illegitimate business myself years ago. I just wanted to warn you to be careful and tell these people to watch what they say. I could feel the perils moving steadily closer. It was a question of time. I did not trust any of the village customers, and I was convinced that at least one of them was a rank stool pigeon. Dewey was my number one suspect, with Nick running a very close second. Narcotics agents operate largely with the aid of informers. The usual routine is to grab someone with junk on him and let him stew in jail until he is good and sick. Then comes the spiel. We can get you five years for possession. On the other hand, you can walk out of here right now. The decision is up to you. If you work with us, we can give you a good deal. For one thing, you'll have plenty of junk and pocket money. That is, if you deliver. Take a few minutes to think it over. The agent takes out a few caps and puts them on the table. This is like pouring a glass of ice water in front of a man dying of thirst. Why don't you pick them up? Now you're being sensible. The first man we want to get is... Some of them don't need to be pressured. Junk and pocket money is all they want and they don't care how they get it. Sooner or later, the betters get wise to a pigeon and the pigeon can't score. Where this happens, his usefulness to the agents is at an end and they usually turn him in. Often, he ends up doing more time than anybody he sent up. After the hotel clerk spoke to me, I moved to another hotel and registered under another name. I stopped going to the village and shifted all the village customers to uptown meets. When I told Gaines what the hotel clerk said to me and how lucky we were he happened to be a right guy, he said, We've got to pack in. We can't last with this crowd. So Bill left for Lexington, and I started for Texas in my car. 
I had one sixteenth ounce of junk with me. I figured this was enough to taper off. And I had a reduction schedule carefully worked out. It was supposed to take 12 days. I had the junk in solution and in another bottle distilled water. Every time I took a dropper of solution out to use it, I put the same amount of distilled water in the junk solution bottle. Eventually, I would be shooting plain water. Four days later in Cincinnati, I was out of junk and immobilized. I have never known one of these self-administered reduction cures to work. You find reasons to make each shot an exception that calls for a little extra junk. Finally, the junk is all gone and you still have your habit. I left the car in storage and took a train to Lexington. I did not have the papers that are required for admittance, but I was relying on my army discharge to get me in. When I got to Lexington, I took a taxi out to the hospital, several miles from the town. We reached the gatehouse of the hospital. In the gatehouse was an old Irish guard. He looked at my army discharge. Are you addicted to the use of habit-forming drugs? I said yes. Well, sit down. He pointed to a bench. You ever been here before? He asked. I said no. Have you got any drugs or needles or droppers on your person? You can surrender them here, but if you take them up to the main building, you are liable to prosecution for introducing contraband articles into a government reservation. I've got nothing. The guard took me to my ward. If you want to get off drugs, he said, this is the place to do it. The ward attendant asked me if I really wanted to get off drugs. I said yes. He assigned me to a private room. About 15 minutes later, the attendant called, shot line. Everyone in the ward lined up. As our names were called, we put an arm through a window in the door of the ward dispensary, and the attendant gave the shots. Sick as I was, the shot fixed me. Right away, I began to get hungry. There were three shots a day, one at 7 a.m. when we got up, one at 1 p.m., and one at 9 p.m. Two old acquaintances had come in during the afternoon. Maddie and Lewis. I ran into Lewis as we were lining up for the evening shot. Did they get you, he asked me. No, just here for the cure. How about you? Same with me, he answered. With the evening shot, they gave me some coral hydrate in a glass. Five new arrivals were brought to the ward during the night. The ward attendant threw up his hands. I don't know where I'm going to put them. I've got 31 dope things in here now. Among the new arrivals was a dignified, white-haired man of 70 named Bob Riordan, an old-time con man, junk pusher, and pickpocket. He looked the way bankers looked around 1910. He had come with two friends in a car. On the way to Lexington, they had called the Surgeon General in Washington and asked him to wire ahead to the gate that they were coming and should be let right in. They referred to the Surgeon General as Phoenix and seemed to know him from way back. Only Riordan got in that night. The other two drove to a town near Lexington where they knew a croaker to get fixed before they were immobilized for lack of junk. The cure at Lexington is not designed to keep the addicts comfortable. It starts at one quarter of a grain of morphine three times a day and lasts eight days. 
The preparation now used is a synthetic morphine called dolophine. After eight days, you get a send-off shot and go over in population. There you receive barbiturates for three nights, and this is the end of medication. For a man with a heavy habit, this is a very rough schedule. I was lucky in that I came in sick, so the amount given in the cure was sufficient to fix me. The sicker you are, and the longer you have been without junk, the smaller the amount necessary to fix you. When the time came for my send-off shot, I was assigned to Ward B, Skid Row, it was called. There was nothing wrong with the accommodations, but the inmates were a sorry-looking lot. In my section, there were a bunch of old bums with a spit running out of their mouths. You're allowed seven days to rest in population after medication stops. You don't kick your head in the shooting gallery, an inmate told me. You kick it over here in population. The night medication stopped, I checked out still sick. On a cold, windy afternoon, five of us took a cab into Lexington. Eventually, I got to Texas and stayed off junk for about four months. Then I went to New Orleans. New Orleans presents a stratified series of ruins. The long Bourbon Street are ruins of the 1920s. Down where the French Quarter blends into Skid Row are ruins of an earlier stratum. Chili joints, decaying hotels, old-time saloons with mahogany bars, spittoons and crystal chandeliers, the ruins of 1900. There are people in New Orleans who have never been outside the city limits. The New Orleans accent is exactly similar to the accent of Brooklyn. The French Quarter is always crowded. Tourists, servicemen, merchant seamen, gamblers, perverts, drifters, and lambsters from every state in the Union. People wander around, unrelated, purposeless, most of them looking vaguely sullen and hostile. This is a place where you enjoy yourself, even the criminals have come here to cool off and relax. But a complex pattern of tensions, like the electrical mazes devised by psychologists to unhinge the nervous systems of white rats and guinea pigs, keeps the unhappy pleasure seekers in a condition of unconsummated alertness. For one thing, New Orleans is inordinately noisy. The drivers orient themselves largely by the use of their horns, like bats. The residents are surly. The transient population is completely miscellaneous and unrelated, so that you never know what sort of behavior to expect from anybody. New Orleans was a strange town to me, and I had no way of making a junk connection. Walking around the city, I spotted several junk neighborhoods, St. Charles and Poitras, the area around and above Lee Circle, Canal and Exchange Place. I don't spot junk neighborhoods by the way they look, but by the feel somewhat the same process by which a dowser locates hidden water. I'm walking along and suddenly the junk in my cells moves and twitches like the dowser's wand. Junk here. I didn't see anybody around, 
And besides, I wanted to stay off. Or at least I thought I wanted to stay off. In the French Quarter, there are several queer bars so full every night the bags spill out onto the sidewalk. A room full of bags gives me the horrors. They jerk around like puppets on invisible strings galvanized into hideous activity. That is the negation of everything living and spontaneous. But I backslide now and then. One night, I got lobotomized drunk in Frank's and went to a queer bar. I must have had more drinks in the queer joint because there was a lapse of time. It was getting light outside when the bar hit one of those sudden pockets of quiet. The noise cleared like smoke and I saw a red-haired kid was looking straight at me and standing about three feet away. He didn't come on faggish, so I said, how are you making it, or something like that. He said, do you want to go to bed with me? I said, okay, let's go. We got to a hotel and he put down some routine why he should go in first alone. I pulled some bills out of my pocket. He looked at them and said, better give me the 10. I gave it to him. He went in the hotel and came right out. No rooms there, he said. We'll try the Savoy. The Savoy was right across the street. Wait here, he said. I waited about an hour. And by then, it occurred to me what was wrong with the first hotel. It had no back or side door he could walk out of. I went back to my apartment and got my gun. I waited around the Savoy and looked for the kid through the French Quarter. About noon, I got hungry and ate a plate of oysters with a glass of beer and suddenly felt so tired that when I walked out of the restaurant, my legs were folding under me as if someone were clipping me behind the knees. I took a cab home and fell across the bed without taking off my shoes. I woke up around six in the evening and went to Frank's. After three quick beers, I felt better. There was a man standing by the jukebox, and I caught his eye several times. He looked at me with a special recognition, like one queer looks at another. He looked like one of those terracotta heads that you plant grass in. A peasant face with peasant intuition, stupidity, shrewdness, and malice. The jukebox wasn't working. I walked the door and asked him what was wrong with it. He said he didn't know. I asked him to have a drink and he ordered Coke. He told me his name was Pat. Do you want a score, he asked. I'm due to score in a few minutes. I've been trying to hustle the dough. If you buy me a cap, I can score for you. I said, okay. We walked around the corner past the NMU hall. Wait here a minute, he said, disappearing into a bar. I half expected to get beat for my four dollars, but he was back in a few minutes. Okay, he said, I got it. I asked him to come back to my apartment to take a shot. We went back to my room, and I got out my outfit. It hadn't been used in five months. If you don't have a habit, you better go slow with this stuff, he cautioned me. It's pretty strong. I measured out about two-thirds of a cap. Half is plenty, he said. I tell you, it's strong. This will be all right, I said. But as soon as I took the needle out of the vein, I knew it wasn't all right. I felt a soft blow in the heart. Pat's face began to get black around the edges. 
the blackness spreading to cover his face. I could feel my eyes roll back in their sockets. I came to several hours later. Pat was gone. I was lying on the bed with my collar loosened. I stood up and fell to my knees. I was dizzy and my head ached. Ten dollars were missing from my watch pocket. I guess he figured I wasn't gonna need it anymore. Several days later, I met Pat in the same bar. Holy Jesus, he said. I thought you was dying. I loosened your collar and rubbed ice on your neck. You turned all blue. So I says, holy Jesus, the man is dying. I'm getting out of here, me. A week later, I was hooked. I asked Pat about the possibilities of pushing in New Orleans. Hmm. The town is in up with pigeons, he said. It's really tough. So I drifted along, scoring through Pat. I stopped drinking, stopped going out at night, and fell into a routine schedule. A cup of junk three times a day, and the time in between to be filled somehow. Mostly, I spent my time painting and working around the house. Manual work makes the time pass fast. Pat and I began pushing in a small way, just enough to keep up our habits. We only took care of people Pat knew well and was sure of. About this time, an anti-narcotics drive hit the town, the chief of police said. This drive is going to continue as long as there is a single violator left in this city. The state legislators drew up a law making it a crime to be a drug addict. They did not specify where or when or what they meant by drug addict. One day I was broke and I wrapped up a pistol to take it in town and pawn it. When I got to Pat's room, there were two people there. One was Red McKinney, a shriveled up crippled junkie. The other was a young merchant seaman named Cole. Cole did not have a habit at this time, and he wanted to connect for some weed. As it happened, I had several ounces of weed in my house. Cole agreed to buy four caps in exchange for two ounces of weed. We began looking for old Sam above Lee Circle. Old Sam was the man these days. It was after doing 12 years in Angola. He was not in the old frame rooming house where he lived. We drove around slowly. Every now and then, Pat would see someone he knew and stop the car. No one had seen old Sam. Those guys wouldn't tell you nothing, Pat said. It hurts him to do anybody a favor. We parked the car near old Sam's running house, and McKinney walked down to the corner to buy a package of cigarettes. He came back limping fast and got in the car. The law, he said, let's get out of here. We started away from the curb, and a prowl car passed us. I saw the cop at the wheel turn around and do a double take when he saw Pat. They made us, Pat, I said, get going. Pat didn't need to be told. He got the car and turned the corner, heading for Carondelet. I turned to Cole, who was in the back seat. Throw out that weed, I ordered. Oh, wait a minute, Cole replied. We may lose him. Are you crazy, I said. Pat McKinney and I yelled in chorus, throw it out. We were on Carondelet, headed downtown. Cole threw the weed out and it skidded under a parked car. Pat took the first right turn into a one-way street. The Powell car was coming down the same street from the other end, going the wrong way. An old cop trick. We were boxed in. And I heard Cole yell, Oh, Lord, I've got another stick on me. The cops jumped up with their hands on their guns. 
but they did not draw them. They ran up to my car. One of them, the driver who had spotted Pat, had a big smile on his face. Where'd you get the car, Pat? He asked. The other cop opened the back door. Everybody out, he said. McKinney and Cole were in the back seat. They got out and the cops went through them. Right away, the cop who spotted Pat found the stick of weed in Cole's shirt pocket. I've got enough here to hold a whole bunch of them, he said. The cop had a smooth red face and he kept smiling all the time. The wagon arrived and we all got in. We were taken to the second precinct. The cops looked at my car papers. They couldn't believe that the car was mine. I was searched at least six times by different people. Eventually, we were all locked in a cell about six by eight feet. Pat smiled and rubbed his hands together. There are gonna be some sick fucking dope fiends in here, he said. A little later, the turnkey came and called my name. I was taken to a small room that opened off the reception room of the precinct. In the room were two detectives sitting at a table. One was tall and fat with a deep south frog face. The other was a middle-aged, stocky Irish cop. He was missing some front teeth, which gave his face a suggestion of hair lip. This type cop could just as well be an old-time rod-riding thug. There was nothing of the bureaucrat about him. The cop in charge was studying the papers of my car. Everything they had taken out of my pockets was spread on the table in front of him. A glasses case, identification papers, wallet, keys, a letter from a friend in New York, Everything but my pocket knife, which the smooth-faced cop in the patrol car had put in his pocket. Suddenly, I remembered about that letter. The friend in New York who'd written it was a tea head, and he pushed weed from time to time. He'd written to me asking the price of good weed in New Orleans. I asked Pat, who quoted me a tentative price of $40 per pound. In the letter on the table, my friend made reference to the $40 rate and said he wanted some at that figure. The frog-faced cop folded the car papers carefully and put them aside. He picked up the envelope and looked at the address and the postmark. Then he took the letter out. He read the letter to himself. Then he read aloud, skipping where there was no reference to weed. He put the letter down and looked at me. Not only do you use weed, he said, you peddle it too. And you've got a batch of this weed stash somewhere. He looked at the letter, about 40 pounds. He looked at me. You better straighten yourself out. I didn't say anything. The old Irish cop said, he's like all these guys. He ain't talking. Till they get their fucking ribs kicked in. Then they'll talk and be glad to talk. We're going out and search your house, the frog-faced cop said. If we find anything, your wife will be put in jail too. I don't know what will happen to your children. They'll have to go to some home. Why don't you make the man a proposition, the old Irish cop said. I knew that if they searched the house, they would find the stuff. Call in the Federals and I'll show you where the stuff is, I said. But I want your word that the case will be tried in Federal and that my wife will not be molested. We went out and got in the car. The old cop was driving and the captain was sitting in back with me. This is it here, said the captain. The old cop stopped the car and honked. A man with a pipe came out of the house and got in the back seat. He looked at me and then looked away, puffing on his pipe. The man looked young in the dark, but when he passed under a streetlight, I saw that his face was wrinkled and he had black circles under the eyes. It was a clean-cut, 
American boy face, a face that had aged but could not mature. I assumed that he was a federal agent. After smoking in silence for several blocks, the agent turned to me and took out his pipe. Who are you scoring off now, he asked. It's hard to find a score now, I said. Most of them have gone away. He asked what record I had, and I told him about the stripped case in New York. How much time did he do on that, he asked. None. It's a misdemeanor in New York. Public health law. Public health law number 334, as I remember. He's pretty well versed, said the old cop. When we got to the house, the captain grabbed me by the back of the belt. Who's in there beside your wife? I said, nobody. We came to the door and the guy with the pipe showed my wife his hunk of tin and opened the door. I showed them the pound of weed I had in the house and a few caps of junk. This didn't satisfy the captain. He wanted 40 pounds of weed. You're not coming up with all of it, Bill, he kept saying. Come on now, we've shown you every courtesy. I told him there wasn't any more. The man with the pipe looked at me. We want it all, he said. I said, you've got it all. Finally, they collected the weed, the caps, and a 38 revolver I kept in the house and got ready to leave. He belongs to uncle now, said the captain to my wife as they left the house. They drove back to the second precinct, and I was locked in. This time, I was locked in a different cell with four strangers, three of them addicts. I lay on the narrow wood bench, twisting from one side to the other. My body was raw, twitching, tumescent, the junk frozen flesh in agonizing thaw. I turned over on my stomach, and one leg slipped off the bench. I pitched forward, and the rounded edge of the bench, polished smooth by the friction of cloth, slid along my crotch. There was a sudden rush of blood to my genitals at the slippery contact. Sparks exploded behind my eyes. My legs twitched. The orgasm of a hanged man when the neck snaps. The turnkey opened the door of my cell. Your lawyer is here to see you, Lee, he said. The lawyer looked at me quite a while before he introduced himself. I can see you don't feel much like talking now, the lawyer began. You're charged in state. I talked to the federal DA an hour ago on the phone and asked if he was going to take the case. He said, absolutely no. There's an illegal seizure involved, and under no circumstances will this office prosecute the case. I think I can get you over to the hospital for a shot, he said after a pause. The man at the desk now is a good friend of mine. I'll go down and talk to him. Two cops took me over to Charity Hospital in the wagon. The nurse at the receiving desk wanted to know what was wrong with me. Emergency case, said one of the cops. He fell off a building. The cop walked away and came back with a heavy set young doctor with reddish hair and gold rim and glasses. The doctor asked a few questions and looked at my arms. Another doctor with a long nose and hairy arms walked up to put in his two cents. After all, doctor, he said to his colleague, there is the moral question. This man should have thought of all this before he started using narcotics. Yes, there is the moral question, but there is also a physical question. This man is sick. He turned to a nurse and ordered half a grain of morphine. As the wagon jolted along on the way back to the precinct, I felt the morphine spread through all my cells. My stomach moved and rumbled. A shot when you are very sick always starts the stomach moving. 
Normal strength came back to all my muscles. I was hungry and sleepy. About 11 the next morning, a bondsman came around so I could sign the bomb. He had the embalmed look of all bondsmen, as though paraffine had been injected under the skin. My lawyer, Ty, showed up around 12 to check me out. He had made arrangements for me to go directly to a sanitarium to take a cure. He told me the cure was necessary from a legal point of view. We drove to a sanitarium in a police car with two detectives. An attendant took my clothes, and I lay down on a bed waiting for a shot. My wife came to see me and reported that the management did not know anything about junk or junkies. When I told them you were sick, they said, What's wrong? What's the matter with him? I told them you were sick and that you needed a shot of morphine. And they said, Oh, we thought it was just a question of a marijuana hat. A marijuana habit, I said. What in the hell is that? Find out what they plan to give me, I told him. I need a reduction cure. If they aren't going to give me one, check me out of here right now. A few minutes later, a nurse came in with a hypo. It was Demerol. Demerol helps some, but it's not nearly as effective as codeine in relieving junk sickness. At 9 p.m., I got another shot of Demerol. This shot had no effect. The third day and night of junk sickness are generally the worst. After the third day, the sickness begins to recede. I felt a cold burn over the whole surface of my body, as though the skin was one solid hive. It seemed like ants were crawling around under the skin. It is possible to detach oneself from most pain. Injury to teeth, eyes, and genitals present special difficulties. So that the pain is experienced as neutral excitation. From junk sickness, there seems to be no escape. Junk sickness is the reverse side of junk kick. The kick of junk is that you have to have it. Junkies run on junk time and junk metabolism. They are subject to junk climate. They are warmed and chilled by junk. The kick of junk is living under junk conditions. You cannot escape from junk sickness any more than you can escape from junk kick after a shot. I was too weak to get out of bed. I cannot lie still. In junk sickness, any conceivable line of action or inaction seems intolerable. A man might die simply because he could not stand to stay in his body. <laughs>